Well, we have lots to be thankful for. And I just wanted to mention right now before I forget, thank you, Ruth, for playing piano this morning. And thank you for our harmonizing trio. I don't know if you could hear the harmonies that well, but they were there, they were doing it, it was beautiful. And uh, the thing is, we just found out yesterday, late afternoon, that Kip was so sick that he couldn't be here. So we rounded up all this talent in just the space of a couple hours. Um, so we're very appreciative. <laughs> So we do have a um, nursery for the youngest ones in, uh, down the hall, but we won't have any children's church or tot time, I don't think. Right, Steph? Okay. And so uh, we'll have the, have the kids stay in if they get... Uh, do we still have the um, boards and the right drawing things and stuff back there? If we need to, we can give them something to write on and draw with and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> morning is um, again Christmas Eve morning and we're not a church that usually has Sunday morning and Sunday evening service like uh, many churches traditionally do and that's been okay for a long time so when we do have a morning and evening service it's only about once every six or seven years when Christmas just falls this particular day on Monday but I thought I would do something just a little bit different this morning We have been talking about retelling the story as um, the Bible tells it. The whole arc of the big story, the big narrative of uh, Scripture. And of course, within that story, there are lots of smaller stories. And we've touched upon those on various occasions. And just beginning last week, we started talking a little bit more about the prophets because the prophets tell the story in just a little bit different way. And there are many parallels between storytelling as it's usually done and the way the Bible tells the story. And this morning I thought, probably the best way to think of the prophets, and in particular the one we're going to look at this morning, is, 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 is in the genre of a mystery or detective story. How many enjoy detective mystery type stories? Okay, quite a few of you. It's not my favorite. I think I kind of got off of them when I was in junior high and um, read the Encyclopedia Brown stories. Did anybody ever read Encyclopedia Brown stories? I could never figure them out. So it was like I gave up. But what's, in a, in a true detective story, what's the big question? What are you trying to figure out? Who done it? Who done it? Exactly. That's another, actually another name for the genre. The Who Done It type books. <laughs> well, we're going to look for the next few weeks <clears throat> at the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah does not ask us to answer the question, Who Done It? <clears throat> but instead, it's the question, Who Will Do It? Because Isaiah, of all the prophets, could be called the prophet of the Messiah. He's the prophet looks to the future and sees the Messiah coming and what that will mean for Israel. So it's about who will do it. And so as we look at Isaiah over the next few weeks, I wanted to begin just by listening to Isaiah. But before we do, there's some problems in reading Isaiah that have to be talked about and confronted. Because Isaiah is one of the more perplexing mystery detective books in the Bible. And so there's four problems that you have to come to Isaiah ready to resolve in your own mind as you read it. The first one is, is what Isaiah writes, is it about the near future or the far future? And again, it's a very tricky problem because sometimes it seems obvious. He's talking about his time frame about five centuries before Jesus, and he's talking about the people, the kings, the world powers of that day. But at other times, it looks like he's projecting far into the future. And sometimes there's words and phrases and sentences that seem to go side by side that refer to one or the other, 
and maybe even sometimes both. But that's something they have to sort out. Another issue and problem that has to be resolved, which we mentioned a couple weeks ago, is when, when Isaiah is talking about the Messiah, is he talking about a man or the nation of Israel? Because there's two ways of understanding it. In some ways, Israel as a whole nation could be considered a messianic nation for the rest of the world because they're the ones who God worked through. So sometimes it looks like he's talking about the whole nation, but at other times it looks like he's talking about an individual within the nation. So we have to decide, is he talking about a person or the whole nation? The third issue is when the Messiah returns, is he going to be a military political leader or is he going to be a spiritual leader? Is he going to be a king or is he going to be a priest? And that kind of runs through the story as well. What to expect the Messiah to be? A ruler coming in on a war steed with his armor and weapons? Or is he going to be a spiritual leader who will lead the nation in repentance and forgiveness for their sins? So military versus spiritual. And then fourthly, and this kind of comes up in terms of hindsight from our perspective, when he does talk about the Messiah to come, and from our perspective we know he was talking about Jesus, is he talking about Jesus' first coming or Jesus' second coming? Because we live in that in-between time when the kingdom of God is both now and not yet. And so, when, again, when you read Isaiah, you have to think, is this something that Jesus fulfilled when he first came? Or is it something that will only be totally fulfilled when he comes again? So those are four issues that we have to uh, think through and listen with spiritually discerning ears. And so what I wanted to do this morning, as I said, is to listen to Isaiah. So I'm not going to do a lot of preaching. I'm just going to read several portions of Scripture that deal specifically with the Messiah, the Messiah that's to come. And maybe even lead, read them in a little bit more context than we often do this time of year. And so it begins in Isaiah chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we generally just read one verse that talks about the promise and the giving of Emmanuel. Let's listen to verses 13 through, 13 through 17. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time like, unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. So again, with that introduction and that verse, it becomes apparent there's an issue. Because Isaiah is talking about a child that would be born very soon and in the process of growing up and coming to adulthood, Assyria will come against the nation. So there's an immediate fulfillment. But then we also know that Matthew said that this verse in the midst of it applied to Jesus as well. And that's why he gave him the name Emmanuel in Matthew. So, again, think about it in terms of now and not yet. Soon, but further on. As we hear again those words that become so familiar. Turn over to chapter 9. 
And again, this time of year, it's a very familiar passage. (laughs) But let's again listen to it in context in the first seven verses. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot, boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end, He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now again, think about those issues. When does this become fulfilled? We have a child promised as well as a government. The prophet says that there's going to be a time when there will be no more war because all of those things used in war will be destined for the fire. War will be known no more. So does it apply to Jesus' first coming? Well, obviously we can't read those words without hearing Handel's Messiah, right? For unto us a child is born. So it was definitely fulfilled at the time of Jesus. Yet not all of it is fulfilled because we still know war. We still know that there's injustice and Jesus has not been installed as the king over all the earth. So again, we think about the now and the not yet, the here and now, but what's yet to come. And we look forward to that day when the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish all of it. Yet to think about that other question, is it only militarily true or politically true or is it spiritually true? Does Jesus reign on his throne now amongst those who see him as king and Lord and Savior? Again, those are dynamics within Isaiah that sometimes defy explanation. Well, let's roll back to chapter 40. The first 11 verses. It's primarily in chapters 40 through 55 that Isaiah deals most directly with the promise of a Messiah. So listen to these first 11 verses of chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a way for a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. A voice cries, or says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all the glory, 
All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. (laughs) You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. An incredible picture of the future that Isaiah gives But when does it happen? When will it be accomplished? We know that the New Testament apostles declared that verses 3, 4, and 5, or at least verse 3, was fulfilled when John the Baptist came. The voice of the one crying in the desert makes straight the way of the Lord. But has every valley been raised up? Has every mountain and hill been made low? and so forth and so on? Has God come with power, with his reward? Has he tended his flock like a shepherd? And again, we can see how it both happened, but it must happen again. Because Jesus did come. And we oftentimes, as in verse 10, we think of power and rule as something very political and military and an evident power that that rules over people that dominates or has dominion but is this one of those times when it's a spiritual rule when it's a spiritual reward maybe like forgiveness of sin life eternal Maybe those spiritual realities are what are informing Isaiah's vision. Yet we also believe that one day Jesus will come and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So again, there's the idea of the now and not yet. The the future that was going to come in 500 years and the future that is still 2,500 years from when Isaiah spoke these words. Turn over to chapter 42. And let's listen to the first 17 verses of this passage. Here is my servant whom I, am up, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. 
you who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them. Let the desert and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives rejoice. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a mighty man. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. For a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers and islands and dry up the, good, the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. <clears throat> Again, that is a great reminder that the theme that uh, Isaiah is writing under is one that we've looked at the past few weeks. Remember, Israel's failure was a lack of worship and the giving of power to idols, trusting idols for their future. And so Isaiah is combating that idolatry with the reminder that only Yahweh or Jehovah is God, and there are no others. And those who trust in idols will be not only disappointed, they will be dismayed when God comes and does everything that he promised for his people, the servant of the Lord. But again, as you're listening, I hope you pick up on these problems. Because in chapter 42, it sounds like he's talking about an individual. Yet, when you get to verse 6, many Jewish rabbis believed that he was talking about the nation. Because it says he'll take hold of your hand, and I believe that your is plural. As is that you have, I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Again, reminding Israel of their vocation to be a light to the Gentiles, to be a priesthood, a holy people who would represent Israel or represent the world to God and represent God to the world. So again, is it Israel as a nation or is it an individual within Israel who would represent the nation? And we talked about that last week, that it seems that in some way Jesus becomes representative Israel. He represents the whole nation. And it seems that that's how one way to solve the mystery and the clues that Isaiah le leaves is to say it's both because Jesus is representative Israel fulfilling their vocation of representing God to the nations and representing the nations to God. Let's flip over to chapter 51. And here are the first 11 verses. <clears throat> Isaiah 51, 1 begins, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Is that you? Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was but one, and I blessed him and made him many. What do those two verses bring to mind? The Abrahamic covenant, the primary covenant that told Abraham that he would become a great nation. And Isaiah is calling them back to that covenant. Verse 3, the Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. 
Listen to me, my people. Hear me, my nation. The law will go out from me. My justice will become a light to the nations. My righteousness draws near speedily. My salvation is on the way. And my arm will bring justice to the nations. The islands will look to me and wait in hope for my arm. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never end, or never fail, excuse me. Hear me, you who know what is right, you people who have my law in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of men or be terrified by their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment. The worm will devour them like wool. But my righteousness will last forever. My salvation through all generations. Awake, awake, clothe yourself with strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days gone by, as in generations of old. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces? Who pierced that monster through? Was it not you who died up the sea? The waters of the great deep? who made a road in the depths of the sea so that the redeemed might cross over. The ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Again, you can hear the mystery. Has Jesus accomplished what Isaiah promised? Or is he yet to do that? We've talked in the past that the, uh, in some ways Jesus paid a ransom for our salvation. So is verse 11 really directed to Israel or is it directed to everybody who is God's family by faith? Are we the ransomed of the Lord as much as anybody? So were these words not written to us in some form, in some way? Again, they're interesting questions, and I'm going to spend the next couple sermons going into more detail about many of them. Finally, let's look at the last section in chapter 55. Again, 51 told us that God's salvation is assured and it's forever. And what will that salvation eventually look like? Chapter 55 gives us a great picture. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love, that is my covenant love, promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sower and bread for the eater. 
so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. <clears throat> and again, a, one of the most wonderful chapters in Scripture because I believe Isaiah is describing the new heavens and the new earth for Paul echoes this, these words when he says that one day the creation will be liberated from its groaning as it waits for the sons of God to be revealed. But again, is God talking about an individual or a nation? Is it going to happen in the near future or the far future? It seems to me that there's a real key in verses 8 and 9 because it becomes evident that God was going to do this in a way that was never expected. He didn't do it by virtue of human reason. He did it by virtue of his own power, his own plan, his own wisdom. In sending Jesus to accomplish all that Isaiah promised in some form, whether it was at his first advent or whether it's when it's completed at his second advent, God is the one that has accomplished it just like Isaiah promised in chapter 9. So as we complete this morning and as we come back this evening, let us keep Isaiah in mind. He promised a Messiah, and we have a Messiah. He promised salvation, and we have salvation. He promised a new reality, a new heaven and new earth. And we can anticipate that not only in the Advent season, but throughout the year. Let's pray. Lord, as we hear your word, and especially as we hear the word of your prophet, we again thank you that you have revealed yourself. You have revealed your covenant love that you would never forsake. Lord, that you always intended to fulfill your plan and do it through your son and all that he accomplished in his life and his death and his resurrection. And so, Lord, again, as your people, we anticipate the future that you have planned. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the season. We thank you for the coming year because we know we are all in your hands as we look forward. You are good in all your ways and you're faithful to your covenant. And to you, we give the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship in song. You guys can come up. And we got some given time to work, continue to worship. What are some more Christmas songs that we can sing? One, two, three. Oh, that's not the beat. Let's see. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Again, it's a wonderful, it's listed as the Advent section in your hymnal. And it truly is because it anticipates what God is going to do. So let's, let's actually stand and sing all four verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Shall 
day spring come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight Shall come to thee, O oh.